Hello everyone, my name is Abdallah Safidin and today I would like to tell you a very short introduction to some best first search solving algorithms for two-player games. So when I'm talking about two-player games, there are many different um, assumptions that we can make, constraints that uh, we could enforce or features that we can enable and to make the domain of this course a little bit clearer, let me look at some examples of uh, games that fall in scope. So Connect4, where one player is trying to align four yellow stones uh, horizontally, vertically or diagonally, and the other player is trying to do the same with the uh, red stones. The player takes turn, dropping st stones of their color in this grid is um, a two-player game that falls in scope. Checkers, Havana, Shogi as well. In all of these cases, the domain is discrete. Players have perfect knowledge of the state of the board and uh, they are purely competing. There's no cooperation at all in these games. Um, let's look at some domains that are not um, in the scope of this presentation. So let's start with poker. Poker can also feature two players, but uh, Imperfect information, the fact that players do not see the opponent's hand, rules it out of the domain. Some game theory scenario might not be zero sum or might not be purely competitive, and they might also feature some statisticity, some non-deterministic events that uh, rule it out from, from our consideration. Here we have the RoboCup, where two teams of robotic agents try to win uh, some sort of soccer match, um, but this domain features physics constraints and uh, a continuous state space and falls out of scope for that reason. And finally, video games such as Tarkraft do not fall in um, the scope of the algorithm I will tell you about today. Um, so let's look at the concrete game that does fall in scope. So the game of Hex, for instance, is a very simple two-player game where one player is trying to connect the top left side to the bottom right side, black player, max, whereas the white player is trying to connect the top right to the bottom left, and the player takes turn placing stones of their color. So a game could go like this. Black starts by playing a stone here that connects to the bottom right. White replies by playing a stone there. This move, both of these moves are pretty bad actually, but um, Let's not judge this virtual player for that. Um, black continues like this, and now there's a threat of connecting the three to the edge. So white is trying to prevent it, but black can continue the path. And now the top left edge is connecting all the way to the center stone. And uh, even if white tries to prevent white, black has a way to connect back to the bottom and win the game. So this is a one, one way to play this game of hex. And the type of question that we are interested in is if I give you a position, can you determine if there is a way for black to force a win out of the game? Or is there a way for white to prevent that from happening? Um, so more precisely, we can be interested in different solution concepts and I will, or different levels of solving a game. But before that, let's uh, write down some notations. So here, I have got an example game tree with uh, nodes that correspond to positions of the game. This is the starting position, and it's controlled by the max player because we have a square. These circles are controlled by the min player, and the diamonds are terminal positions. They are not controlled by either player. The border of the node tells us if um, the position is a win or the position is a proven loss or if we haven't determined yet the status and uh, some positions exist but we have not encountered them yet in our exploration. Okay, so uh, what can we see here? Here we can see for instance that uh, this is a terminal position which is won by minute. So it's a lost position from the reference of the first player and this is a mean node, so that mean player can choose to move the, if the game ever reaches this position, mean can move it to a terminal state that's a loss. So mean has a strategy here to force the game to be, to be a loss. That's the essential idea. So 
what are these different levels of solving I was telling you about? So the simplest one is the ultra weak solution. So that just states that we know the status of the initial position. Uh, we know whether the starting position is a black win, a max win, or a loss. And uh, the way that we obtain this knowledge might not be through running any algorithm. That can be through the mathematical demonstration. And that's the case for the game of hex, for instance, where we know that on any board of size n by m for any integers n and m, the starting player has a winning strategy but we do not know what that winning strategy is because the proof of existence is non-constructive. Um, on the opposite end is the strong solution. So here we require that we know that we have access to the status of every position in, in a reasonable amount of time. So um, here in this example, all positions all have, have been solved we know for each position whether it's a theoretical black max win or theoretical min win. Many games have been uh, strongly solved. Tic-tac-toe comes to mind, of course. It's such a simple game that figuring out who wins in any position is, is relatively easy. Connect 4 was uh, solved in uh, 1995 strongly, and Pentago is a recent example. For the game of Hex, if we look at boards that are sufficiently small, then we can say that the game has been strongly solve on these small boards. Now uh, the last concept is that of a weak solution. So what is a weak solution? It's something that corresponds to a winning strategy for, for a player. So here we have a weak solution for the red max player. Um, it lets from the starting position it recommends a move for red such that no matter the answer of blue um, we obtain either terminal state that is won by red or another internal state where Max still has the possibility to force a win. And so formally this constraint is that we want to have a set of nodes such that for every Max node in the set there exists a child of the node in the set. For every min node in the set all children are in the set. The starting state should be in the set of course and any terminal node encountered throughout um, the set should be a uh, max win. And dually we would have a strategy for the min player where the condition would be the duals. So here we have that hex was solved weakly on board larger than six by six. It, the current best solution is on, or the largest board is on nine by nine. Um, a weak solution. Connect4 was also solved weekly six years before the strong solution and the um, landmark result is of course checkers that was solved in 2007 uh, weekly and proving uh, that the starting player cannot force a win. Okay so what's another important concept or perspective is that of transposition. Sorry uh, I just wanted to say as well that uh, we may have different weak solutions. So this one is one example of a weak solution and that is another example of a weak solution. You can see that it's a different set of states but it respects the same um, properties. And now which one of these two weak solutions is the best? Well that depends on, on your need. If you just want to establish that black, that red has a winning strategy from here, any of them would do. So you would maybe go for the for the shortest to prove. Um, so yeah, transposition. So if you can go from one position to another position via two different paths, two different sequences of intermediate positions, uh, then then the topology of your state space is not a tree anymore. It's actually a directed a cyclic graph and um, most of the algorithms can be adapted to that setting. This is very common in actual games, but you need to spend a little bit of effort in your programming to make sure that uh, that the cases are handled correctly. And um, when transpositions occur, this is usually an opportunity for you to share computation and save time in uh, calculating the 
outcomes. So then another type of transposition can occur, that's when you come back to a position you visited before, and that creates a cycle. So now the structure of the graph is that of a directed cyclic graph. This phenomenon is very rare in concrete games. Um, even in games like chess and go, you don't have real cycles because the rules of the game will f either forbid the cycle from occurring or um, if you find the same board position that doesn't correspond to the same state because in one case it will be a draw and the other case the game continues. However, we still need to know how to deal with these cycles because they occur very often in game abstractions. So in chess or in Go, if you discard the history um, and what positions were visited before, what board were visited before, then um, in this abstract version of chess, you have cycles. And uh, reasoning in that abstract version of chess is usually much faster and scales better than reasoning on the real game of chess that includes the whole history. But it's much more complicated. Um, if you want to know more about transposition, the key word is the graph history interaction. There's uh, plenty of papers, especially by uh, Kishimoto and Müller, on how to deal with the graph history interaction problems with the various algorithms. Um, so yeah, with that, I'll wrap this this part.
hello again. So we can now start with the main part of my presentation where I will introduce to you um, several best first search algorithms for two-player games. Um, so what, are, what do I call a best first search algorithm in that context? It's an um, algorithm that will store in memory a partial game tree that has been explored so far and then update it progressively. So uh, for each node, we will store local information, local statistics, and then um, select node after node, child after child, where the tree should be grown next. We then expand it, evaluate what we've just expanded, and then update the tree in memory based on the new information we have gathered. And it turns out that uh, several algorithms for two-player game solving can be very nicely expressed within the same framework. And then what distinguishes one algorithm from the other is what are exactly those statistics that are stored in nodes, how is the selection made, and how is the update made. So um, today I will introduce proof number search, which is uh, beyond that first search is probably the, the most important solving algorithms for two-player games, and minimal proof search, which is a variant that has nice theoretical properties, uh, Monte Carlo tree search solver, and product propagation. So let us start, get started with proof number search. So how does it work? We've got this a bit scary table, but it tells us all we need to know about the basic version of the algorithm. So for each node, we will be storing as statistics two numbers, one is called the proof number, one is called the disproof number, and these numbers range between zero and infinity. When we create a new node in our tree, uh, we will initialize it with one one if it's not a terminal node, or with zero infinity if it's a terminal node that is a win for max, with infinity zero if it's a win for min, and I will run you through an example very soon. Um, when we do the descent of the tree to find a leaf to expand, um, we follow this decision rule to go all the way down from the root. So when we are at the max node, we will pick the child that minimizes the PN statistics. And when we are at the min node, we will pick the child that minimizes the disproof number. Then um, for the update, for the the proof number of the parent, if it's a max node, will be the minimal proof number across the children. And the disproof number of the parent will be the sum of the disproof numbers across the children and the dual for the min nodes. So, so that's the basic idea, uh, the basic definition of proof number search. Um, and before running into the example, let us maybe look at um, why it's important, maybe, so, so and, and what is there to say about it. So the main idea of proof number search is optimism in face of uncertainty. In a sense, this is a greedy algorithm in the context of two-player games that will attempt to prove that Max wins or that Max loses um, by trying the direction that seems to be easiest to, to complete the proof. And that's why we say that it's a very optimistic algorithm. Um, it has been very successfully applied in checkers, Komoku, Hex, Shogi endgames, usually in combination with other techniques, uh, whether endgame tables or uh, domain-specific uh, pruning. Um, besides the initialization that I've shown on the previous slide, there are many other ways to, to do it, and that can often lead to practical improvements. Um, when should one use proof number search rather than say that first search or some other solving algorithm? Some clues that um, the algorithm might be performing well is if the domain has a variable branching factor. If the branching factor is not uniform at all, then the proof and the disproof number, depending on the parts of the trees, will be varying a lot and that will be guiding the search. On the other hand, if the game tree is very uniform, then the, the algorithm will simplify down to breadth search. 
Uh, another thing that will help usually the algorithm is if the domain features traps or certain death. If you make a mistake, um, then you can have a very early end of, end of the game. Um, on the other hand, if uh, solving your instance requires sometimes going very deep into variants, then uh, this algorithm should shine because it uh, is capable of doing that, of focusing on areas that um, seem promising and then following through for dozens, if not hundreds, of uh, plies deep. Um, so, if you want to know more about proof number search than, than this and the example that we will see next, what would be the next step? I would suggest to read up on the FPN, which is uh, a very important variant in practice, a little bit like IDA star, uh, addresses some of the memory limitations of A star. Yes. The FPN addresses some of the memory limitations of PNS, proof number search. There's an excellent tutorial by um, Martin Miller and Akihiro Kishimoto at the AAA 2014 tutorial that uh, spends an hour and a half on proof number search only and um, for sure they can go into more detail than, than in this brief introduction. Um, so let's now look at, uh, at an example. So we've got this partially expanded tree and I've written down the rules for um, proof number search on the bottom left. And uh, we wonder what would the algorithm do next? So remember that the way the algorithm works is that we have a loop and we will iterate in our loop through descents in the tree, expansions, updates. Descents, expansions, evaluations, update. Okay, so starting from the root, we will do a descent. So we will select which child of the root um, seems most promising for proof number search is preferred. So the root is a max node. And so we are told to pick the child that minimizes the PN. This child PN is three, this one is two, this one is one. So proof number search will go in that direction. We expand um, the children of that node and um, one of them is a terminal node, one by which is a loss. So we initialize it with infinity zero. The other one is an internal node. So we just initialize it with one one. Now that we have done the development, we can proceed to the update starting from, from these uh, newly added nodes. So we update using the update min rule because this is a min node. So the proof number is the sum of the children's proof number, infinity plus one makes infinity. And the disproof number is the minimum across disproof numbers. So minimum of zero and one is zero. Um, we proceed and update further. So now for the root node, the, it's a max node. So we use update max. The proof number will be the minimum across three, two and infinity is two. The disproof number would be the sum of one, one and zero is two. And we're done with the first iteration of the algorithm. So we go back from the root to descend the tree using the selection. So select this node, that child, expand, update, 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 done with the second iteration. The third iteration tells us to expand around here. We do our updates. Fourth iteration gets us stronger there. And as you see, uh, the algorithm ends up focusing on this area because of its greedy nature. Um, in the algorithm's opinion, it could prove the whole game if only it managed to to, fight, to, to solve this node. Whereas if it went in there, it would need much more effort. It would need to solve this node, that node, and that node. So optimistic as it is, it thinks that it's about to solve this node. So it's better continue in that variation. And indeed, the game is now over, or the proof is now over, because after this back propagation, we have obtained a value zero infinity at the root, which corresponds to having proven that max pair wins in this node. So we have a weak solution to our domain. Okay, so 
as I was saying, what happened is that proof number search went for the optimistic uh, direction, but ended up with a proof that was quite a bit larger than what was necessary if it had gone in this direction. There could have been a proof smaller there. And that's what the next algorithm was made to address. The minimal proof search algorithm is a very similar to proof number search. It has the same range of values, same initialization, just the update adds one plus here, here, and here. And you can think of it as in single agent search, if a proof number search is similar to greedy best for search, uh, that focuses on the H value of the nodes, and minimal proof search is similar to A star, that adds in the G cost to uh, make sure that we don't get lost too far. Okay, so the nice thing about minimal proof search is that it has the guarantee that it will eventually find the smallest proof tree if there is a max win, or the smallest disproof tree if it's a min win or a max loss. So it will output a proof or a winning strategy of smallest size either way. Um, that's only true if we are provided with a tree. If we are provided with a DAG, it might not uh, get the smallest. And as a matter of fact, finding the smallest proof DAG is a very difficult uh, problem to solve. Okay, um, just like in proof number search, we can vary the initialization and the other steps um, to try and, and increase the, the speed of our implementation in some domains. And natural ways to do it is through mobility or admissible domain-specific heuristics if we have any. Uh, we can also introduce edge cost and node cost to the update. Uh, you see here that we have added just a one, but if we have a domain specific cost that's not one, then uh, we might as well use that instead. Um, this algorithm has been uh, actually used in variants of chemical synthesis planning um, and also in some shogi end game solving. And of course, um, I see the fact that it has the guarantee of outputting the smallest proof T as a theoretical success. So when would one use the minimal proof search algorithm? Well, when the size of the proof matters, then that's a good reason. If we want to obtain small proofs, whether it's for independent verification or storage, or as in chemical synthesis, because the steps, the moves of the game cost us money, uh, or time, then we might want to favor something along the lines of minimal proof search. Um, if the actions have cost, uh, that can also be a, a good reason to look in that direction. And also if you use proof number search and then you realize that it's greedy nature makes it lost, get lost too deep, then um, going back to minimal proof search can be, can be a natural thing to try. So let's see it running. Um, we start with the same partial game tree as before, except that the values stored are now the MPN and the MDN, which will be different numbers because of the different update rules. The selection starts by recommending the same node. We do the update. Already, we have a slight difference here. Instead of having infinity zero as in proof number search, it's infinity one, which will have an impact on the MPN of the root. Going further, we expand here, backtrack, update the root, the value doesn't change. Um, in here, we develop, backtrack, the value of the root changes, and also the value of that shall change, but not enough for uh, MPN to prefer that one. So we do further updates and now uh, the minimal proof number here is five compared to four there. So we have invested some time there and it looks less promising to the algorithm. So it's going to say, okay, I need to go elsewhere just to check if I can't find anything simpler over there. And that's um, how it finds the smallest weak solution to the game. Okay, so next, Algorithm in line, multi-color research solver. 
I assume that um, most people in the audience are familiar with multicolored research. Um, so let me just insist how this one can be seen with the same framework as proof number search. Um, so we define the statistics to store in the, um, in the node. So that will be the reward and the simulations as in the normal multicolored research. And then for the solver part, we add a flag, which will be um, this is a proven loss, this is a proven win, or this is still unknown. When we initialize a node, uh, we're going to perform one simulation, uh, one Monte Carlo simulation, and store the, out the outcome, whether it's a win or a loss, in that reward counter. And the flag is set to unknown because there's not a final a terminal node. If we create a, uh, if we initialize a win node, then we can immediately set the reward to one and the flag to, to true. If it's a loss node, we set the flag to false. As for the updates, well, the number of the cumulative reward for a node is just the sum of the reward over the children, and the total number of simulations is the sum of simulations over the children. Now, um, to be a bit pedantic, there should be one plus here, and, and the, the recording of the very first simulation that was done at that node before the children were expanded, but that's a fairly small detail. Finally, for the selection, we use the UCB formula. So we are going to trade off uh, the exploration versus uh, the exploration factor versus the exploitation factor. So moves that looks good already are tempting, and moves that haven't been explored a lot are tempting as well. Okay, so we all know that MCTS has been very successful in uh, building Go engines and other game engines. Um, as well in non-games applications, but what about the, the solver part of this algorithm? Um, does it add anything? Well, it turns out that we can exhibit some domains, Havana is the, the one I'm most familiar with, where the problem was solved using multicolored research solver and couldn't be solved with a proof number search. So in Havana, this is a connection game similar to Hex that we saw um, a moment ago. Um, that features a very uniform branching factor that only decreases by one move after move. And um, it's very difficult for proof number search to find any guidance. However, the Monte Carlo playouts in Havana are quite informative and help the solvers um, search to be guided in the, in the right direction. So when could it make sense for one to use Monte Carlo to search solver? Well, if it's a domain where we know that MCTS is already very good, and that was the case for Havana. Um, then it's a it's a good candidate to try and solve it with this uh, this algorithm. If the branching factor is mostly uniform, that doesn't mean that MCTS solver will be specifically good, but it usually indicates that PNS will be bad, and so that could be to the advantage of a MCTS solver. Um, okay, so last best first search algorithm for the day, the product propagation. So here we just have a single statistics that we store per node, and it's a floating point number between zero and one that we call the, pro the probability number, not proof number. I apologize for this. And um, we initialize it to 0 0.5 for non-terminal nodes, to one or zero if it's a win or a loss. And these numbers, when we have a min node, we'll multiply the PP of the children's, and if it's a max node, then we'll take the, the dual. So one minus the product of one minus the PP of the children. So what's the intuition between this, behind this? It's that if the solving a node was a random event that had probability PP of C for the child C, and if all children were totally independent, then this would compute the probability that um, that the parent is a is a win, and that also is a win. So for the parent to be a win, if we have a min node, we need all the children to be a win, and so if they're if we have the probability that each of them is a win and these are independent probability, then the joint probability is just a product. 
as for uh, the max, the way that max can be a win is it suffices that one of them, one of the children uh, is a win. And so what is the likelihood that one of them is the win? Well, it's the opposite of all of them are losses. And this corresponds to a child, the probability of a child being a loss. Okay. So what about this, this algorithm? As I was discussing, the main idea is to draw inspiration from probabilities. Of course, we know that these games don't involve probabilities and a position is either a win or a loss. It's not has no likelihood attached to it, but it's just inspiration to create a guided search algorithm. It doesn't need to actually correspond to the reality. When you implement this algorithm, you will uh, quickly see that uh, you run into numerical instabilities. Uh, when you multiply these floating point numbers in the update rule, you will very soon end up with tiny, tiny uh, numbers very close to zero, or very close to one, and then um, approximations will, will lead to problems. So you need to find a way to mitigate it. Um, it's an interesting algorithm that has been rediscovered by, by many people. I think maybe this uh, Slagle and Borsky reference might be the earliest one, but then many people later reinvented the algorithm without knowing of, of prior work, um, because it's a, such a natural idea. That being said, although many authors, uh, myself included, were able to show that uh, on some benchmarks, the PP algorithm works better than proof number search or than MCTS solver, um, that remains fairly, fairly uh, sparse successes and no, no really impressive um, success. I, I can't report anything like that. So it's not so clear when this algorithm would be, would be helpful. But uh, I think it's a very, very cute idea. Okay, um, I'm about to conclude. One thing that will come up if you implement any of these basic algorithms is that the memory will be the bottleneck for your implementation. That through this uh, iteration of uh, descending the tree, adding some nodes, updating the tree, descending the tree, adding some nodes, we are filling the memory and creating a partial grim game tree increasingly large very quickly um, and so memory is, a, is an issue. So what have people done about it? Well, you can derive an iterative version of these algorithms. DFPN is the most famous one, but there's also exists the first version of MCTS. Um, and this, just like IDA star, gives you an easier control on, on how you spend your memory. That's one, one way to deal with the memory issue. The other way is to uh, perform some sort of nesting. So instead of, say, take proof number search, instead of initializing internal nodes to 1, 1, we are going to call another algorithm uh, and let it run for some time and use that outcome to initialize the, the 1, 1, uh, sorry, the leaf. And uh, that means that the algorithm, the information stored by the algorithm will be more reliable um, from the get-go. So with fewer nodes stored in memory, we have more information. Uh, but that takes time because the bounded budget algorithm is not, is not instantaneous. Um, and this, this approach can very naturally be distributed of a cluster using the job level idea where you have a master that controls a main search and then whenever a new node is created in that main tree, uh, the corresponding position is sent to a client computer that will uh, perform a bounded budget version of, say, proof number search on it, and then return with either win-loss, if it could prove anything, or the final proof number and the final disproof number of the root of that client uh, job. Okay. So um, to conclude, I've presented today a unified framework for solving algorithms. Um, in my opinion, it will facilitate conceptual explorations and comparisons between um, quintessential ideas in, in um, game solving. And uh, we had the example of optimism in the face of uncertainty with proof number search, 
the probabilistic analogies that product propagation gave and the Monte Carlo method uh, that is so powerful in finance and physics um, turns out to be useful in games as well. What's another advantage of, of um, this approach is that it makes it very clear the connection between these different algorithms and then very easy to reuse the good ideas. DFPN works really well in the context of proof number search. No wonder people developed later the DFUCT variant. PN square also works really well when it inspired the PP square um, approach, which also had uh, relatively good results. Um, the same sort of things happen when we extend these algorithms to multiplayer, when we extend these algorithms to deal with multiple outcomes, so not just win-loss, but win-draw-loss, or even a score between 0 and 100, and uh, when we want to develop distributed algorithms. So um, I hope I've uh, convinced you to look a bit closer into these best first search algorithm and maybe you can invent your own using that same framework that proof number search MCTS solver product propagation are using. Thank you for your attention.